So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, ministers, ambassadors, dignitaries, and, and friends. Uh, as I was asked to set the scene for this session, it's a very interesting topic, I was thinking that maybe I'll start with three anecdotes uh, which, which, has, which have remained with me over the years. Uh, the first one, many years back, uh, there was a discussion uh, about how people trade and uh, whether the competitive advantage of all nations when they trade is appropriately factored and monetized, or is there indeed exploitation? Coming from, the, uh, coming from me in India, maybe back in 1991, when possibly uh, we, we were still li living under license raj and stuff, it was possibly uh, very, very certainly an uh, India story. Many years later, and this is, this is almost 20 years later, the question was, as capitalism sort of came through in many parts of the world, that there is now equality, and I'm getting value for what competitive advantage I have. But there were also noises which were starting to happen that is there someone particularly exporting deflation in the, across the world? And that's something uh, that continued for a very long time, unless the many disruptions that we face today came to bear and particularly became more and more intense after COVID, technology disruptions, and of course, you know, the, the challenges that we have had on the demographics across the globe with an aging population in many parts of the world. And then more recently, as uh, in my role, and you know, I have this role of uh, incentivizing investors to sort of invest in India, I was talking to many, many investor groups, uh, I've been speaking to many investor groups, and one of them in particular said, uh, in reference to the PLI schemes that we have all been celebrating and which, which we think is a success, one of them asked me the question that uh, India is doing what it is doing, we, we acknowledge that, et cetera, et cetera. And then they said that for, for many years, the world has lived with red deflation. Is this going to mean that we will have to live with orange deflation? And those remarks always remain with me. And I, was, I, I wondered as to why those remarks got made. I think the challenge on some of these really is that when we talk about a world which has increasing, increasingly become globalized, and we, we acknowledge that, is it also being inclusive? And is that globalization, is the globalization being balanced? And I think those are the two things which come to my mind. And those three, uh, those three incidents or anecdotes that I mentioned to you, whether I get enough value for my competitive advantage, uh, advantage that I bear, point number one, point number two, the first anecdote. The second one, uh, I'm getting value, but is deflation being exported? And point number three, is the color of the deflation getting changed? I think that's something which have remained with me, and I just feel that it has got to do with the fact that, that while we all acknowledge, or most, of, or most of us acknowledge, that globalization is the way to go, is there a need for it to be more inclusive, and is there a need for it to be more balanced? And I say that because over a period of time, the winners and the losers might change but that will always be the case. Today, supply chains are so interlinked. Whether the supply chains, whether we look at, uh, we look at men, material, capital, effectively, those are the three factors. When we talk about labor costs, labor arbitrage, it's, it's changed over a period of time. For instance, from a, from a labor standpoint, India is today far more competitive than ever before. From a capital standpoint, it's always been the case as to how, uh, how capital flows happen. Today, a lot of capital flows in, go, go into the emerging markets, but then money gets pulled in whenever there is a crisis. And then we talk about material, because as people have more and more to invest, as they are more capital sufficient, and they have more to invest in themselves, maybe in technology and up, upskilling for themselves, they are able to generate IP. And as they're able to generate IP, intellectual property, they, they wish value for it. So the winners and the losers might keep changing. Yesterday it may be the East, tomorrow it may be the West. 
Yesterday, it may, may be the West. Today, it may be the East. Tomorrow, it may be somebody else. The key challenge is that are they in harmony? Are they in, uh, is this inclusive? And are they in balance? Now, you know, we are talking about this at a time when global trade has continued to grow in spite of the challenges as to whether we need to be more globalized or less globalized. And as, as many, of, many countries have, have, have thought that there is a need for them to near shore, friend shore, and in some cases, on shore. And why is that so? Because there, is, there are security challenges, or there are challenges that are being caused to them because of, because of over-dependence, or simply because the costs have gone up too much, or, or simply because they feel that they, are, they have been ravaged or at times taken for granted. Yet, it is true that since 1990, global trade has gone up 24%, and in some ways, 50%, it, it's gone up 50% uh, for the poorest uh, countries. In 2022, the global value chains accounted for 52% of global trade from 48% 40, in 2015. So in spite of all those inhibitions that people have had about deglobalization, global trade has continued to grow. And in some ways, uh, there will always be long and short-term challenges. There will always be this, this issue of self-reliance and how much self-reliance is important, how much national security is important when, important when it comes to uh, thinking about not trading so much or being self-reliant. I think the question really is inclusiveness and growth. Let me make just two points, and you know, I'll just possibly hand it over to Indrani at that point in time. One, one potentially uh, a solution on a question, uh, and the second one really uh, something that we all talk about. You know, we talk about intellectual property. And that creates value and that should have a premium. Looking back, when the COVID crisis came along, there was a discussion, because we were all in crisis, that should the vaccine be available to the entire world at a lower price. We have been talking about the India stack that India has developed, which has effectively been developed by the government, the public sector, and on which there has been a significant amount of innovation that has been done by the private sector, and today we are talking about how that can be exported across the, go across the globe. And Mr. Vaishnav uh, spoke about it yesterday, that we are willing to do it for any multilateral agency to come in and sort of, uh, sort of export it to the, to the world, developed by, by India. A question that I have, maybe the, maybe the panel wishes to discuss it, should intellectual property come at such premium? Nobody is saying that it shouldn't, but should it come at such premium that it goes against the societal needs and the needs of everybody across the globe? When we were in COVID, we were thinking that should there be premium charged by those pharma companies? Many countries came up with their own vaccines, as did India, but there was a thought that emerged that should, should the licenses come free of cost? Maybe the challenges that we are facing, and particularly with all the challenges that, that we face with the environment, because you know, we are all dealing with a significant environmental crisis, it is time to think that should some of these come at such a premium or should we actually have uh, a cap on what prices and what premium the intellectual property draws. The second one, we are talking about supply chains and we're talking about challenges that many countries have. India also might have a challenge right, right now because of what's happening with the Suez Canal. I think the, ch the, the, the question then is that how do we build resiliency in these supply chains, and also build certain amount of sustainable focus in each one of this. And what is the promise that we are able to do for each other? Yes, there will be, again, some winners, some losers. The key question really is that in a world which is getting increasingly disrupted because of the huge energy challenge that each one of us faces at this point in time, how can there be greater resiliency in these supply chains? What is it that each one of us can do to make sure that you know, there is, there is the whole sustainability quotient comes in in some of these supply chains. And one of the very critical things is, what is the impact and what, is the gain, what are the gains that technology can offer? I think those would be my three points. Uh, Indrani, maybe I'll, I'll sort of give it to you. Uh, I mean, these are just topics that I came up with as I was thinking about this session. Uh, deglobalization, uh, should intellectual property come at such a premium, and sustainability as you think about global supply chains and the disruptions that they are going through. Over to you, Indrani.
Thank you, Sanjeev, uh, for that uh, scene-setting exercise, and it helps us a lot in this panel. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Red Haze. Uh, we're talking about de-risking this afternoon. <coughs> we, uh, in the last couple of years, whether it is recognized by any of the world's dictionaries or not, but we have put in a number of words into the dictionary. Uh, we started with um, decoupling, then we did French shoring, we've done China plus one, uh, we have done uh, globalization, we've done a re-globalization, and we are uh, we've now taken the golden mean of de-risking. Um, we, do we de-risk as an economic, purely as an economic activity, or are there significant uh, parts of the national security piece that comes in here? Uh, is it a political uh, piece? And uh, I would argue some of it is entirely political. And, uh, but to begin us, uh, to start us off this afternoon, um, we have voices from very different parts of the world because de-risking uh, or the challenges of de-risking or maybe the opportunities of de-risking have different lessons for us in different parts of the world. Um, I will begin with Jan Lipovsky, Foreign Minister of Czechia. Um, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome to India. And uh, uh, de-risking means something very different to people in India and to people in the Czech Republic. Um, would you like to take us through how uh, the whole piece of de-risking has been approached by uh, your country? Um, do you see it as a challenge? And if you do, um, how do you propose to uh, mitigate that challenge? Thank you. Thank you for having me and, and congratulations for this amazing uh, place and conference to be. Uh, I am always thrilled to be in India, and thank you for the great hospitality. Uh, the, the, the term of the risking, it's, uh, it's an attempt to label our common activity uh, to face the reality that in some cases we are too much dependent on China. That's, that's clear. And uh, we need to understand what this dependency means and how can we uh, make steps that uh, our position uh, will be better. And uh, logically, the, the best solution is diversification, uh, not to have a one supplier of medicine, uh, because uh, if the, uh, when there were some disruptions in the medical market, uh, we were facing a lack, a lack of uh, those medicines uh, back in Czechia. Also, there are sectors, and uh, I think we are quite clear in that, that, that for example, in the, in the field of emerging technologies, uh, we don't want to create a new dependencies. So it's an it's a approach with, which looks sector by sector on this kind of dependency. It's not saying that we don't know to have any kind of relationship with China, that we don't want to have any kind of trade, because that would be the term decoupling, which was not flying, and I think it's for obvious reasons. But we have to acknowledge that there are some risks and we want to approach them. And of course, uh, as a member of the EU, as a member of NATO, we are very careful with that. Uh, so we have our national security strategy. We have a strategy for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific region. And we are looking for good friends here. India is a big friend of Czechia. We have very intensive bilateral relations. And we are working, for example, on innovation and technologies. So that would be my very simple answer to your question. So is, uh, does India serve as a plus one for you in term, when you are de-risking or diversifying uh, from China? And if, if so, which, which are the areas you spoke about innovation and technology, but which of the areas would you uh, consider that is important to de-risk from China? So first of all, uh, I am not so naive that I could say that the India would replace China in this kind of relationship because India is a different country. It's the biggest democracy in the world. And there is a reason why we fear of our dependency on China too much. Uh, we are not saying that you, we don't want to trade or have some kind of investment, but it has to have a certain limit, even for us. Um, India is a country of uh, many opportunities, and we are looking for a good ways how to, how to diversify. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very friendly and thriving relationship. 
in case of Czechia in India, and I would like to thank to all of those who are active part of that. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Jurag, I, to you, uh, you know, COVID taught uh, us all many lessons, um, and a lot of the, the questions about de-risking and about decoupling, or even diversification uh, from concentrated geographies, uh, were sharpened during COVID. Um, is that where you started your journey on uh, uh, the decoupling or the de-risking question? First of all, thank you very much to having me here. Uh, you know, I have read uh, what has been written in the session descriptor. Concerns that the global value chains are insecure and unsustainable have become since the pandemic almost a consensus across the world. You know, uh, I don't like, I am not really familiar with any generalization, you know, and I think the pandemic is something very specific. We have to take into account that this past, uh, pandemic was something which has to be analyzed for many aspects because uh, the behavior of the government uh, were, was uh, very specific. Uh, there was a threat to lose the life, you know, that's why it was very, very specific part. So we have to take into account many other aspects uh, of uh, the risking and also the uh, supply uh, crisis, uh, which is uh, climate change, which is uh, uh, natural disaster or war crises. And so those aspects are very much influencing this uh, supply change. And also, I, I'm probably not the right person, I am politician, uh, I don't like really uh, to label any country with some red or whatever, because uh, the first of all for the free trade is to respect everyone, you know? And that means that this risking could be also with other countries or other alliance which uh, is taking part in the Europe. So let me give an uh, example, for example, for, uh, from the pandemic. Uh, of course, it was a very tough situation, and uh, our country ordered, for example, the masks, which was uh, very important for some reason. And we ordered from one country, from the European Union, I, I will not mention it, uh, and everything was done and paid and so on, and the delivery was stopped at the border, because the country and the government realized that it's also important for them. But there is another example, some country delivered even more. So, we have to take into account that all country, at the end of the day, look after of its interest first. So this is very important to, to think about it. So if we are talking about the China, we have to take into the consideration history why this happened. This happened because the, the profit as a basis of capitalism has, has made some job. Everyone wants to uh, order the, any goods or, or machine in the country where is, uh, the labor hand uh, costs very cheap, you know. That's why the China grow and any other undeveloped country, and they want to be a part of uh, the global uh, market. So this is, has to be uh, taken into account. And if we are talking about Slovakia, you know, Slovakia is the third open country in the OECD. So that means we are very dependent on uh, uh, export and import. We are the first uh, of uh, the production passenger car per capita in the world, by the way. We produce one million car per, per year, which is uh, enormous. And we are dependent very much on chips, for example. We are produced in Asia, in Taiwan, and, and so on. But there is another uh, example, because uh, we are a member of European Union, now we are facing uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, and uh, we are sharing some kind of agriculture policy, for example, you know, within the European Union. But now we are, have re we have very big risk from the Ukraine uh, duty-free grain, you know, because someone said, okay, we will open the border for this grain duty-free, and it's a big threat for our policy, common policy, uh, agricultural policy. What we are going to do? One question is, 
is it uh, the uh, is it the protectionism or not once this could uh, destroy your agriculture also you have to protect somehow uh, somehow because every politicians every government is responsible first of all for its people responsible for prosperity its country and so on that's why it's some kind of m mixture of it and we try to diversify we used to be uh, very dependent on uh, the gas and crude oil from russia because well, it was very easy during the sunny days life you know it was no problem pipelines were working no problem at all even the thunderstorm for uh, the liquid gas uh, was not disturbing this, you know. So now we are facing a new, uh, new era and we have to diversify. And how to diversify is the question because we are a member of the European Union, we are sharing some common policy and also we want to do uh, the policy on every direction of the globe. We want to have a good uh, relation with the China, also with the India. They introduced very um, uh, enormous projects like One Belt, One Road, and uh, India introduced uh, IMEC project, which is also very important. Is it uh, uh, protectionism or not? I don't think so. Only what we have to do is to give them respect, not to label them somehow, to give them respect, to have a dialogue and discussion, and to find a common way how to cooperate, the best way. And that's why we are here with uh, the biggest uh, uh, delegation, Slovak delegation of uh, businessmen, to try to put uh, um, uh, our business on this market and vice versa. So that's my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elizabeth, to, um, uh, to go back to the BRI, uh, Italy walked out of the BRI. That is a serious action on the de-risking uh, platform. Um, how did you get there? What did you, uh, what were you thinking? And what do you think as we, what are you thinking as we go along? Well, first of all, let me say that your question comes to no surprise to me. Um, now, uh, talking seriously, I think that the very heavy geopolitical and geoeconomical shocks uh, that our countries had to go through and actually that we are still facing in these days uh, have allowed uh, uh, great vulnerabilities uh, to become very evident uh, to all of us. Uh, in this respect, uh, the role that the Italian intelligence uh, played uh, was, I would say, very, very relevant. Uh, we were asked uh, to scrutinize uh, what was uh, happening in my country and uh, also in neighboring countries as well as uh, worldwide. Um, the, uh, let's say, re realizing that uh, uh, at the beginning, starting with the beginning of the century, the uh, free trade started declining. In parallel, uh, we saw uh, an enormous increase uh, in uh, PTA agreements uh, and together with that uh, restriction in trade, uh, the COVID, uh, uh, the war in Ukraine as well as the conflict in the Middle East, not to talk about uh, disinformation campaign, uh, cyber attacks, uh, terrorist attacks, have proven to us uh, the vulnerabilities of our systems. And, uh, of course, uh, we were also trying to identify where these vulnerabilities uh, were uh, originated. So, together with the political decision to withdraw from the Belt and Road Agreement, uh, we were trying also to reflect on how to uh, reshape our relations uh, with China. And let me say that in no way uh, we want to abandon the Chinese market. But certainly, uh, we thought that it was definitely necessary to introduce de-risking measures. I'm not talking about decoupling, I'm talking about de-risking. What does de-risking mean in this context? Um, of course, we could elaborate on that, but to be very simple, I would say that de-risking means uh, creating uh, an alternative, a plan B that would allow us 
uh, to diversify not only our supply chains, but I would suggest also our networks, be it the communication networks, trade networks. It could also mean uh, uh, diversify our uh, relations with uh, friendly countries, uh, friend shoring exercise. But uh, I would also suggest that a plan B, a de-risking uh, um, approach, uh, could act as a deterrent. And this is very important if you have in mind China. Of course, if you are over-dependent from a country in terms of supply or in terms uh, of uh, uh, networks, uh, a country that wants uh, to utilize its own advantages, its own economy, in order to implement uh, a coercive economy, then can do it easily. The moment that you put in place de-risking measures, the deterrence of those measures can act also to induce that countries to stop uh, implementing that kind uh, um, of uh, approach. Uh, in this context, uh, um, what we are trying to do is very much in line with uh, uh, the concept which is elaborated uh, uh, among uh, uh, countries of the European Union. I don't want to list, of course, the different principles that uh, we are working on, but uh, let me just mention one, because uh, this one is very relevant to our policy with China. And that is, uh, uh, namely, the concept that we should try to protect ourselves from economic risks. Protecting ourselves has induced uh, uh, this government, as well as the previous one, to elaborate and to expand the legislation which actually was already introduced in 2012, uh, what we call the Golden Power legislation, which uh, allows us to scrutinize very deeply foreign investments in Italy as well as uh, export uh, uh, control. Uh, the government in Italy has the power not to authorize acquisitions by foreigner investments and it has as well the possibility to uh, review corporate resolutions uh, in specific areas uh, which are very relevant to our national security and uh, to our national uh, interest. There is an obligation to notify acquisitions uh, in those sectors. Uh, of course, you can think which one uh, they are, defense, uh, energy, uh, and communication, and whatever you have. And it has, uh, the government has the possibility not to authorize, as well as uh, to introduce uh, specific restrictions uh, which companies, uh, as the Italian one as well as the foreign investors, are obliged to implement. This, of course, is a measure that we have applied very intensively, also with very innovative uh, measures, uh, in an, quite a few uh, cases uh, uh, with respect to Chinese investment. Thank you. Uh, uh, you spoke about the d risking as an economic risk. Is it, is it a national security? Do you also look at it as a national security risk? Because presumably when Italy signed on, uh, there was a political situation that was different from where it is today. Well, I think uh, that today it would be a mistake to consider national security only from one angle. Uh, national security encompasses uh, all sectors, uh, and definitely economic security has become crucial for our own national security. Not only for our own, but certainly also for our partners' one. The moment that you implement a French shoring policy, it's clear that uh, your economy has to be integrated with that of, those, uh, uh, of the friends that you have chosen, and it is quite clear that your own industry has to comply with your own national interest. There is one point that uh, I mentioned, namely that the vulnerabilities uh, have demonstrated to the government the importance of de-risking policies. I'm not so sure that the public opinion, as well as industry in my country, and probably also in other countries, uh, have the same awareness. So there is also need for us to work on awareness by the industry and by the public opinion. Thank you. Uh, that brings me to Maurice and talking about awareness. Uh, we, 
there are there are platforms like this where we talk about de-risking. Um, how how is it? How easy is it for the average person to even understand what de-risking means, and what is it that we can all do to um, to make this a much more of a comprehensible uh, problem? Uh, thank you, Indrani, and may I thank uh, Rosina for inviting me back uh, and uh, acknowledge uh, my friend uh, Minister Jayshankar and the MEA and ORF for uh, the extraordinary effort that they make uh, to put on this superb dialogue uh, each year and all its um, baby dialogues popping up around the world. I think, Indrani, there is a real obligation on governments and particularly on like-minded governments uh, to ensure that we uh, apply what I call the antidote of sunlight uh, to this problem. Exposure, exposure, exposure. Expose foreign interference. Expose the compromising of supply chain, ch chains. Expose the sorts of, uh, of things which lead to challenges to national security uh, that have been, uh, have been spoken about already today. I don't think that de-risking, for example, is, uh, is something that should be seen as protectionism. Uh, in fact, I would absolutely reject that proposition. I think it's an essential part of doing business in the 21st century. It's an essential part of doing business as a nation. If the first priority of any government should be protecting its people, uh, then by extension, protecting them and ensuring that you have the capacity to, uh, to have the products that you need in your own country, whether they are imported or, uh, or homemade, uh, is part of that, uh, that priority. Um, it's about protecting national security uh, and it's about growing capability and then sharing that capability with countries who might find themselves vulnerable to the same challenges but not have the capacity to address them. They know the vulnerabilities are there but they need the support of friends, partners, allies uh, to provide uh, that supply chain protection, for example, which they can't necessarily uh, provide or enjoy uh, themselves. So for governments, leaders need to be open with their people, with their populations. They need to be open with industry about what is happening, what the challenges and threats are to uh, production and to supply chains, uh, who is doing it, which authoritarian states, which malevolent actors are causing the problems that are experienced right around the world now? And COVID-19 served to sharpen our focus absolutely on this subject, but has it sharpened it enough? I think that is a live question. Uh, and has, uh, has COVID-19 combined with, in some cases, economic and strategic coercion, including from China, has that really sharpened our focus enough? Is there more to do? And I think for leaders and governments, there is more to do uh, in that case. Uh, and we need to be very clear about why we need to protect ourselves. And so that sunlight shining on, uh, on those issues uh, is a good way to, uh, to alert our communities, to engage our populations, and to paint a picture for them for what the future looks like if you don't protect yourself. If you don't de-risk, if you don't friend shore, what does the future look like? What does it look like for your telecommunications system? What does it look like for your infrastructure? Do you then see your equivalent of Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI in the United States, sitting in front of a parliamentary committee in your country explaining that every single vulnerable piece of infrastructure in your cities is being hacked and is therefore vulnerable to being turned off at the flick of a switch by another country? a malevolent actor. That's what we all face the challenge of seeing in the future if we don't, in my view, take out the sort of insurance that, um, that we're talking about today. It's no time for BAU. This is not a business as usual time for the globe. It's no time to, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. We have to build resilience. And in my personal opinion, it needs to be done with urgency. I've been reflecting on this uh, as part of the discussions uh, this week. Are we, at least metaphorically speaking, on a wartime footing? Maybe it's a cyber war. Maybe it's a war in the cloud. But is it a wartime footing? If it isn't, 
When will that start? And if the answer to that is we're almost already there, then the, the need for resilience and the need to make sure we're responding accordingly is right now. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Jorge, your, Mexico is uh, literally the US's largest trading partner. The US has started its, uh, a very significant de-risking strategy beginning with the IRA, the CHIPS Act, the CHIPS and Science Act, what have you. Um, is the US's is, the, is Mexico's de-risking strategy completely aligned with the US? And if not, why? Um, my second question to you, and because of your own experience, is China's not sitting around waiting for everybody to de-risk from China. China has, its, has started its own retaliation. Li Qiang has already spoken about uh, de-risking being a ridiculous uh, policy. They, they have retaliated with sanctions by restricting imports of um, critical minerals. Where is this going to end? So, so yes, I, I, I think that's the right question if uh, the U.S. view of the risking is the same as Mexico's. Uh, I'm cynical of the U.S.'s point of the risking. I think it's just an excuse for industrial policy. Nothing wrong with it, but I think that's what it is. Uh, there are enough choke points in the supply chain for no country to completely be able to de risk completely. Uh, nevertheless, one should try to, to, to be as resilient as possible. Let me tell you what I see as, as a risk for Mexico, for most developing countries, but even for developed countries, in this case, uh, maybe Germany would be the most uh, clear example right now, and that is being too dependent on the Chinese market or on the Chinese supply. And that is, for me, a huge risk for countries because China weaponizes that dependency. They exercise commercial coercion. They do it openly. Now, a case can be said that, well, every country uses commercial coercion. Look at what they're doing to Russia. Look at uh, export controls on China. Maybe, but those are clear commercial Coercion. That is to say, there are boundaries set. If you trespass them, there are consequences, there are guidelines, and it's usually constrained to national security, military issues or industries. The problem with China is that one, it's not transparent. Two, it is mostly political. If you say something that they don't like, it happened to Australia, strictly political, it happened to Norway, happen in Canada, uh, of course Lithuania. Uh, so that for me is a huge concern, the fact that they will weaponize that dependency you have and the risk is not just the market, the risk is the loss of sovereignty. Because you see a lot of these countries precisely because the way China manages these things precisely because they are not transparent about it, you see leaders or constituency or in interest groups saying things like, well, you, can't upset, you cannot upset the Chinese. Well, you can understand the way the Chinese think. See, nobody in Mexico says you can understand the way the Americans think or you can understand the way the Indians think. Nobody says these things, but somehow the minute you say something, oh, well, you can understand the way the Chinese think. And once you start playing that game, you are losing sovereignty because you are not speaking freely for whatever it is in your national interest. So that, to me, is a huge risk. And how to address it? I think Maurice hits on it. It's just bringing it to light. And I'd like to, to challenge people to the following thing. See, uh, post-COVID, we're going to see, uh, once again, uh, countries, uh, government officials leak commercial delegations to China. Once, I mean, even though it's a shrinking market, nevertheless, they're going to try to uh, open the market for whatever it is they're, they're trying to export to China. And I think it would be a good exercise any time a government official from a foreign country, whether it be a mayor, governor, uh, president, uh, prime minister, head to China with a commercial delegation, to ask them before, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to keep this market you're going after. 
they would say, of course, nothing. Okay, fair enough. Can we get you on the record on this? And we have to start doing these things because they will use that market to coerce a country the minute they like it. Now, in the case of Lithuania, they had the EU to back them. Good for them. A country like Mexico does not have that much dependency on China. We mostly uh, do business with the United States and the EU. But a country, and I'm making one up, uh, just like Colombia, if they are commercially coerced, they will have no one standing behind them. And they have to be ready and prepared in understanding when they go looking for that market to know what are the, the, the risks. The same when they bring in imports from that market, say, for instance, uh, telecommunications, to know that they may be subjected not just to the national security uh, risk of, of a shutdown, but that maybe they would not be as interested in upgrading the system when it's time to upgrade it or in servicing it. Things like this, and, and again, you say, well, why would they do that? Well, they do. They, they, they weaponize trade. So that, to me, is the most important area to the risk right now. Thank you. I will come back to you on the Chinese retaliation. But I wanted to go back to uh, the, both uh, the foreign ministers of Czech Republic and Slovakia. Both of you are members of what has now become the 14 plus one. Uh, it used to be the 16 plus one, it is now 17, it is now the 14 plus one. A, what has that got you? And B, um, in this current atmosphere, while we are all talking about acting on this, the whole concept of decoupling, de-risking, diversifying, what have you, how do you square your membership of the 14 plus one with all of this? If I may start, uh, we need to start with uh, the right description. What does it mean to be so-called member of 14 plus one? It's a set of memorandums. It's an activity initiated uh, by, uh, by China. So there is no membership, there are no commitments, uh, and it's up to us uh, basically to, to attend or to see a value in it. Uh, so currently uh, we have not publicly said that, you know, we are banging the doors. Uh, we are uh, basically waiting to see uh, what, will, what will happen and that's, that's the, the current position uh, where the Czechia is. And, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's, um, yeah, it's quite clear and we are communicating this is why. Gerard, you want to have? You know, some comment was, was said that the, there is a very crucial um, question, why do we start it to do the business with the Chinese? Why the Chinese are so non-transparent and so on country? Because we wanted to do the profit, of course. So we have to take into the consideration. And back to my first speech uh, that uh, to be a part of this uh, 16 plus uh, whatever, it's about the dialogue. How you can solve the problem if you have a, no, any dialogue or discussion? That's very important. That's why, as a member of the European Union, and together with the uh, officials of the European Union, we have a dialogue with the China. We have a dialogue with the India. We have a dialogue with the South Korea, and, and so on and so on, with the Canada, and so on. This is very important what we have to do right now. We don't want to have another iron cotton. You know, we used to live in the social order. And we know what is the sanction against the Eastern countries. Of course, we can discuss about the history and so on, but it was not very easy to survive at the time. And if we don't want to have this iron cotton again here. We want to discuss, we want to solve the problem. We want to try to find a like-minded country and to persuade others, let's cooperate. Let's establish uh, the free trade agreement about the certain rules and so on. This is very important, what we emphasize very much from Slovakia. That's interesting. Uh, can I just go back to Jorge? Because I wanted to, you to come back to, uh, I mean, it's not China only weaponizing its trade and China not only weaponizing your weakness or anybody's weakness. Uh, it is, it, it's, uh, it, they take it as a sovereign action. We've felt it during COVID, um, you know, 
about 10 years ago, we were buying power plant equipment from them and we went into the same uh, sort of spiral of not being able to service them. Um, but China is planning its own retaliation and it's doing its own retaliation. Uh, Li Chang, as I said, has already been on record on this. What's, how is this going to play out in your view, since you know both sides really, really well? I, well, let me just say that a, a free trade is in concept a great idea with China. Australia has one. It didn't stop uh, China from retaliating commercially, so they don't tend to respect those free trades as much as one would expect when they establish one. So that's something to keep in mind again when, when, when we're uh, thinking of uh, dealing with China. Now, how will China retaliate? Listen, they don't have much of, I think this is a golden opportunity right now. Uh, China has immense uh, industrial overcapacity right now, and they have a shrinking economy. We, we have, and, and that is structural. It's not cyclical. The Chinese economy will not grow the way we used to, and they will not reduce their industrial capacity, so they will be seeking markets abroad, which is a huge different risk that needs eight different panels. But they will be looking for markets right now, more than we will be wanting them to come to our markets. So that gives us, every country in the world, a, an opportunity to exercise leverage with China in that sense. So you spoke about uh, automotives, you spoke about cars. I, I, I'll use it just as an example. So China uh, has an installed capacity uh, for 45 million cars a year and a market for 20 million cars a year. That means they're exporting or they're gonna try to export all those other cars, and I'll give you an example. Now, they're num the number one uh, car export country in the world. A country like Mexico is their second largest destination for cars. Why Mexico? Mexico is the sixth largest manufacturer of cars. Why is China exporting cars to Mexico when we produce a lot, and it, it's one of the biggest employers in the country? The answer is, I don't know, and I'm afraid nobody's paying attention to this in Mexico. So, so, so that, those are the risks I'm talking about. That's right, so Slovakia, which produces more cars than uh, many other countries. Per capita, per yes, capita. Yes, per capita, that's right. Um, I'm going to now, uh, I'm going to open this up for questions uh, from the floor. Um, the youngsters, the Raisina fellows, uh, if you have questions, please identify yourselves, uh, be clear and be concise. Yeah, thank you. I'm Roberto Italia from Italian think tank uh, ISPI. Uh, my question is, how can countries like uh, the G7 members, Australia, Mexico, can better align their, their risking strategies? Because we should not forget uh, uh, the discomfort in Europe uh, for uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and also the way the US uh, approached uh, the Netherlands uh, in taking sanctions against uh, uh, advanced semiconductors. So, uh, thank you. Who, uh, would, would, do you have somebody you want to address this to? Or anybody can take it? Okay. Go ahead. I actually wrote, I actually wrote down when uh, Jorge was speaking earlier uh, and he made his comment about Colombia, um, should they need to push back, would be left alone. That that's why partnerships are so important. Partnerships between uh, like-minded uh, countries we're not all the same sort of democracies. We're not all democracies. We have different systems of government, different governments, but the capacity to focus on protecting your own sovereignty, protecting your national security, is something that can be a shared focus. I absolutely agree, and it must be a shared focus between partners and allies and friends, and to grow those relationships. What was really interesting about COVID, and particularly um, if you are uh, if your job is to travel the world as a foreign minister uh, and all of a sudden that tap is turned off and you spend most of your life online engaging with, uh, with counterparts, the many laterals that uh, rose up during COVID period to cooperate on, uh, on procurement, to cooperate on de-risking of supply chains, they have faded, certainly, but I don't think the concept and the value of those uh, has faded. There is more work to do so that there are partners protecting each other in a time of significant challenge. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I was a part of the G20 negotiations team under the Trade and Investment Group. And your name is? Uh, Dipan Singh. Thank you. Uh, under the Commerce Ministry. Uh, we worked on multimodality, and my question is to all the panelists. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we faced was a single unified document. I think de-risking comes, uh, you know, multimodality is a very important aspect for it. And uh, a lot of pushback we received was from Europe. So why can't we have a single unified document for multimodality? Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Uh, would you? Jan? Or Elizabeth? Why can't we have a, a single a single docu agreement for multimodality? Is that right? Yeah, uh, I mean. yeah. Well, uh, of course, we all aim at uh, a fully agreed uh, document. The process uh, is something that we should accept, so I'm not at all surprised that there are differences. Um, I would like to take uh, uh, this question in order to expand uh, on an issue which is also related uh, to the risking. Um, the uh, global high-tech chains are limited by definition. Therefore, access to those chains is limited. And till now, we have seen a lot of, uh, let's say, protectionism attitude in not allowing access to those chains to all countries. The point I want to make is that if we really mean to implement the risking policies, we should keep in mind that access to supply chains as well as to high-tech uh, supply chains should be granted to all countries. Uh, I want to commend the Japanese uh, presidency of the G7 for having uh, pushed this uh, issue throughout uh, the presidency and also India during the G20 presidency of India had very much clear in mind the need to promote sustainable development uh, everywhere. What I want to say in this room is that the Italian G7 presidency is certainly determined in following up both the Indian as well as Japanese presidencies in order to allow uh, a plan that would uh, uh, let's say, a result in an agreed upon method to reform the system and to promote sustainable uh, development everywhere. The Africa plan that my Prime Minister has recently launched in Rome will fit into this scheme and we very much hope to get the collaboration of the Global South and in particular of India in uh, having this kind of concept broadly agreed. I don't think that we will manage to get uh, a consensus of all countries in the world, but certainly we would hope to get as much agreement as possible on that. Thank you. Yes? Uh. Uh, hi, I'm Ashirwad Devedi. I teach economics at Delhi University. Where are you? Uh, I'm Ashirwad Devedi. I'm here, one of the fellow. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm uh, my question is, uh, China is clearly circumventing high U.S. tariffs by exporting to the U.S. via Mexico. What should be done in a situation like this? Thank you. Uh, I'll take yours as well because we will be running short of time. Uh, myself, Modit Vashish from St. Stephen Center of Advanced Learning. Uh, my question is from Ma'am Mary Spain. Uh, Ma'am, uh, a good example of French shoring is, uh, can be witnessed in the formation of uh, a supply chain resilience initiative between India, Australia and Japan. Uh, so my question is pretty simple that uh, what does Australia uh, have uh, to offer on the table uh, uh, to counter the weaponization of economy uh, by China? Thank you. Did you get that, Maurice? Do I generally? Yeah. John? So, I... uh, uh, just quickly on the China exporting to the United States via Mexico. I think you're referring to a Financial Times article came out yesterday. I thought it was a little misleading. Chinese exports of intermediate goods have increased to every single country in the world with the exception of the United States and Japan. So China is exporting to the United States through every single country that trades with the United States. I, I, I start by saying that and that's why I say that at the end of the day I think it's next to impossible to completely 
get China out of the supply chain. Uh, I think if you want to address dumping or avoiding them, I think the way is to go regulatory rather than through tariffs. The problem with tariffs is that uh, 25 times zero equals zero, and China can bring the price down to zero easily, and they will. So tariffs will not necessarily be the solution. I think it's going to be more regulatory, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you uh, for your question. I think um, I'd begin by saying that uh, uh, essential to Australia's survival as an island continent at the bottom of the world is free trade. Uh, and that has overwhelmingly been uh, the approach of governments of uh, which I have been a member. That's enabled us to, uh, to effect a free trade agreement between Australia and Japan in uh, 2014 or thereabouts. Most recently, with the work of uh, colleagues like Minister Jashankar and uh, other members of the current government uh, in India, the uh, India-Australia Economic, uh, Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, the IA ECTA, uh, those sorts of, uh, of partnerships and, and strategic, uh, pieces of strategic architecture between countries uh, I think are essential to, uh, to making sure that those relationships grow, that those relationships offer more to other partners, uh, particularly regionally. And in my experience in the last 10 years, give or take, um, from about uh, 2013 to, uh, to 2022, uh, as a member of, uh, of a government uh, which is very focused on, on partnerships and relationships, that's been very productive. I think transformative indeed, I would go so far as to say for the Australia-India relationship and equally so for the Australia-Japan relationship and they meet nicely in the middle. Thank you. No other questions? I'm going to go to closing remarks by everybody. I will begin from the other end, so Jorge, to you. Closing remarks. I had nothing, pre I had nothing prepared to, to close. <laughs> uh, but let, let me just say uh, that I, I just briefly mentioned, and, and we're talking the risking. The new thing we're going to start noticing about China is the export of its overcapacity. And the risk there is going to be deindustrialization. That's a huge risk and it's going to come much faster than we imagine it. There's not much time for us to pay attention or learn about it or our respective bureaucracies to understand it. So be on the lookout uh, for this uh, phenomenon. It's going to be happening in all of your countries. Marie? So I think starting from risk and, uh, and agreeing with uh, Jorge on his, his observation, this session and the other sessions that have been held through the, the dialogue which have touched on the questions of de-risking, of friendshoring, of, protection, of protecting national sovereignty and supply chains, I think are absolutely fundamental takeaways for, uh, for when we all leave um, this, uh, this iteration of the, the Rezina dialogue. And I was completely serious when I said I regard this as the most urgent priority for governments uh, around the world. And I was e equally uh, serious when I said that the only way to do this effectively is with partnerships with friends and allies and partners uh, together because uh, it does require people to stand with you, countries to stand with you when you are dealing with these challenges. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth? Well, partnership and cooperation are two words that uh, over the last uh, two, three days have emerged practically in all sessions. Just to conclude with a positive example uh, uh, with respect to partnership and cooperation, I want to mention the European Union-India um, agreement on trade uh, and technology, an example of uh, friendly countries that can effectively cooperate in an area which is becoming, uh, let's say, crucial for our national security and for our national interest. Thank you. I will con uh, continue with the partnership and cooperation with another uh, suggestion like respect of each other, rules very clear to be followed and protection, free trade, dialogue and discussion and building the resilience. This is what we need. Thank you. Jan, you get the last word. <laughs> you know, it was the 90s, I think it was... 1992, when Bill Clinton won an election campaign with the claim it's about economy stupid. Uh, and the whole thing now is about security. So 
I think the claim would be it's about security. It's stupid. If he would be running now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being a great audience. And uh, thank you to the panel. That was fantastic. Thank you, Indrani, for your moderation.